Good morning again, everyone. <laughs> um, for those of you who it may be your first time here uh, this week, I want to let you know I am Jason Airwood. I'm the worship pastor here, um, and uh, our, our pastor, our lead pastor, is Derek Fielder, and uh, you saw him on the video earlier, and he is on some well-earned time off this week with his family, and so um, I get the opportunity to open God's Word with you again this week, which I'm excited about, and uh, we're still in the middle of our summer series, uh, Family Vacation, so we're going to take a look uh, at Psalm 98 today. So if, you're, um, ha if you have your copy of the scriptures, turn to Psalm 98. Um, and what we've been doing all summer long is looking at the Psalms to find answers to questions that we often ask in our life. Um, and, you know, there, there's been a lot of questions that we've had answered, and we'll talk about some of them today, but... Uh, we're going to ask a very specific question today that I, I know I, if I'm being completely transparent, I struggle with this question probably the most of the questions that we've talked about uh, this summer so far. But let, let's start by doing this. By a show of hands, how many of you would agree with this statement? Life is hard. Who would agree with that? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty much all of us. Life is difficult, right? Life is hard. We face difficult days every single week of our lives. We face difficulty. There are circumstances that bring us to our knees at times, and they make us wonder where God is in all of it. And we face things each day that can cause us to begin asking some questions, and we even begin to question God. And we say things like, God, where are you right now? Or God, are you even there anymore? Or God, why are you letting this happen to me? Or God, will you get me out of this situation? And sometimes we even ask God, how in the world do I get through what I'm facing right now? I, I've asked some of these very questions recently in my life. We face really hard times and it makes us ask questions of God. And it's not questioning who God is, it's just questioning how I feel in relationship to God. And we struggle sometimes. I know I'm not alone in having questions like these at times, and I want you to know that you're not alone either. You're not alone in having questions. And it's okay to have questions. God is big enough to handle our questions. We're not alone in that. We um, we all ask questions like this at times, and we find answers to these questions in Scripture. And we, quite honestly, are just the most recent in a long line of believers who ask questions like this. The Bible is full of instances where people ask questions of God. I mean, we began this very series back in June by looking at Psalm 13, where King David asks a series of questions. See if this sounds familiar to you. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Have any of us ever felt like that? It's, this is a safe place. You can admit it in here. Because if you're saying you haven't felt like that before, you're lying. So, so we feel like that at times, right? Will you forget me forever, Lord? Where are you right now? So we're not alone in seeking answers to questions about God. But you should also remember that God has not left you alone in your questions either. God has not said, yeah, I don't know, buddy. Figure it out. You're on your own. God doesn't do that. He's with us even when we have questions. Uh, there's a, um, a guy named David Platt. You've probably heard of him. He writes this. He says, Amid the inevitable questions you and I wrestle with in this world, the God of the universe is faithful. Even when your faith starts to falter, God is faithful to be with you, to help you, to uphold you, and ultimately save you from a world of sin and suffering. And that is what Psalm 98 addresses for us today. Today, we will find the answer to this question, because I think that we can sum up all of those questions that we've mentioned into this one question, which is this. How can I know God will be faithful to me? How can I know that God will do what he says he's going to do? How can I know? Well, Psalm 98 is going to answer that for us. So um, if you're able to stand, let's stand together in honor of the reading of Psalm 98 today. I'm going to start in verse 1, and we'll read through to the end. God's Word says this, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. Exclamation point. Remember we talked about punctuation last week? It's important. 
He's done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and with sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You guys can be seated. Now, in this passage today, you may say, Jason, I missed it. Where does it answer the question, how do I know God will be faithful to me? Well, I'm glad you asked. I think there's three things that we see in this psalm that are going to help us answer this question. So let's look and see how we can know that God will be faithful to us even when we face difficult things. The first thing that we see in this passage is that God showed his faithfulness to Israel. If you're taking notes, let's write that down. God showed his faithfulness to Israel. Remember last week we talked about the structure of the book of Psalms? Do you guys remember that? This is yes, this is no. Do you guys remember when, when we talked last week about how Psalms, the book of Psalms is broken up into five smaller books? you guys remember that? Yes, okay, good, we're all on the same page. Well, um, it's split into five books, and Psalm 98, just like Psalm 96 that we looked at last week, is in book four. And one thing that wasn't mentioned last week is that book four is a poetic retelling of the deliverance of Israel and the promises that God made to Israel. So if you were to start, book, book four starts in Psalm 90. If you were to start there and read through, you would see this poetic retelling. And um, Psalm 98 sort of serves as a kind of culmination of that retelling. It starts in Psalm 90 with Moses' intercession for God's people, which is found... Um, in uh, the book of Exodus. So uh, Moses goes and prays to God for his people, and there's a retelling of that in Psalm 90. Uh, Psalm 91 talks of the promise of a king from David's line. A restatement of God's promises from Psalm 1 and 2 are found in Psalm 92. God being enthroned is Psalm 93. Confidence in God is found in Psalm 94. The promise of future rest in God is Psalm 95. And last week, we looked at Psalm 96, where we saw this call to worship God. So the fact that Psalm 98 begins with this command, seeing a new song to the Lord, should really come as no surprise. It's God has done incredible things. And remember we talked about last week that when God does new things, a new response is warranted for that. When God has a new showing of who he is, we got to have a new response to respond to that in worship. James Hamilton wrote, This new song is necessary because God has done new wonders. Because just as at the Exodus, when he brought his people out with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, here again, in Psalm 98.1, his right hand and his holy arm have achieved salvation for him. So it's this really cool retelling. I would encourage you, it's just a few pages. In my Bible, it's one, two, three, four pages. And so I think that we can all read four pages in Scripture. All right? I would encourage you, go home this afternoon and read those, those eight Psalms from 90 to 98 and see this retelling. But here's the question you may have. Why is this helpful for us in 2023? Why is a retelling of the Exodus story helpful for us? Well, what God did for his people in Israel is relevant for us today because it attests to the fact that the Lord keeps his promises. The Lord keeps his covenant promises. And at the same time, it also confirms that he will ultimately redeem his people and judge the world in the process. So God had promised that he would deliver his people from, Israel, or from Egypt. And he did. God promised that he would send a king through the line of David. And he did in Jesus. God promised that he would save people and redeem us back from sin and death. And he did in Jesus' work on the cross. And so it's just this constant attestation to say that God says he will do something, and then he does it. And it's the same, the same thing is true for us as God's people today. 
in uh, the first three verses, the word salvation is found in each one of these verses. Look at what it says. Verse 1. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Look at verse 2. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Verse 3. He's remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel, and all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Our God is a saving God. He is a God who works salvation and redeems his people back for himself. Amen, indeed. It, does, uh, it describes the great deeds of God for the sake of his people as a whole, that he provides protection from our enemies and the conditions in which devotion to God can flourish. The salvation is a worldwide display of God's righteousness as he keeps his word, enforces his standards, fulfills his promises, and redeems his people. So the fact that God saved his people from slavery in Egypt and brought them into a promised land is notice to the world that he will do what he says he's going to do. And the fact that he sent Jesus to redeem us is even more proof that he will continue to do what he said he will do. He's going to do what he says. We can trust God at his word. Look with me again at verse 3. Look what it starts here. It says, He remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Now, did did God actually have to be reminded of the fact that he loves his people with a covenant love? I mean, we're talking about the omniscient creator of the universe, right? And doesn't remembering something imply that at some point he forgot something? You guys are not on the same page as me, I don't think. So, for it, for it to say that he remembered something, that would imply that he had to be reminded that he had forgotten something, right? Well, let me, let me set you at ease. God is not like us. While you and I forget things all the time, I forget my own children's names sometimes. And I'm sure you do too. You laugh because you've done the same thing, I'm sure. God is not like us. God never forgets. Now, there can be times where we feel like God has forgotten his steadfast love toward us, as wickedness might grow around us and it looks like he's forgotten to listen to us or help us or provide for us. But our feelings do not mean that God has forgotten us. Even though we may feel that way, it does not reflect reality. God's word says that God absolutely remembers us and his covenant love for us. And in fact, when God is letting us feel like he is somewhat distant, it actually allows us to have an opportunity to exercise our faith, to say, God, even though I can't feel you close right now, I trust that you're there. I trust that you're still thinking about me, that you still love me. Our circumstances do not define our relationship with God. God defines our relationship with God. So even in the face of really difficult times when God may feel far, far away, he's still there. Our circumstances don't define that relationship. God defines that relationship. And he says, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will not forget you. Amen, right? That's something to celebrate. If there was a point we were going to clap at, that's one where we should clap, right? That God is with us, that he will not forget us, and that he's for us. God's word is clear that he is faithful to us. Even when it seems like the world is caving in around you, you don't ever have to wonder if God has forgotten you. God is faithful, which means that he hears you and I in our groaning. He sees us in our suffering. One of the Hebrew names of God is El Roy, which means he is the God who sees. God sees you. God knows what you're going through, and he is with you. He has promised us that. God sees us. He knows you, and he loves you, and he doesn't ever forget you. God's covenant love for his people, for us as God's people, cannot be broken, and it cannot be forgotten. Despite our unfaithfulness to him, God remains faithful to us. He has not forgotten us. He has kept his promises to us, to love us, to care for us, to keep us, to save us from our sins. And this gives us reason to celebrate. And it brings us to our second point. The second thing that we see is that we are invited in to worship around his throne. We are invited in to worship around his throne. Verse 4 
calls for all the peoples of the earth to come and worship the Lord. He says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. And if you were to look at the Hebrew there, all the earth, what that means is all the earth, everyone, all the people of the world should worship God. He has put his salvation on display for all the world to see. And the only proper response is worship, to be invited in. Everyone who dwells on the earth is invited to celebrate the deliverance and salvation that God has brought to his people. And this is no small, somber worship service where we stand and quietly sing and then mumble to ourselves, amen, that was good, that was good. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here. This is a joyous celebration of the greatness of our God. Remember, if I'm not mistaken, every verse, verses 4, 5, and 6, what's at the end of those verses? An exclamation point. That's right. This is a joyous celebration. It's not, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. This is, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Our God has shown us salvation. Let's celebrate. That's what this is here. There's a joyous celebration. And listen to these activities that are described. It says in verses 4 through 6, make a joyful noise. Break forth in joyous song. Sing praises. And, and listen to the instruments. There's the lyre, which is like a guitar. There's trumpets. There's horns. There's the sounds of melody, which is voices singing to God. To me, this sounds like one kick and shindig that's happening in the name of the Lord, right? That we are celebrating God's salvation. And God is worthy of it. We talked about this last week. God is worthy of more than our mere presence in this room. We should hold nothing back in our worship of the creator of the universe. God's salvation was given to Israel and revealed for the rest of the world to see, and we're all urged to take part in worshiping him. And, and why is this so important, and why is it so warranted? Well, in a world of sin and suffering, and remember, just a few moments ago, we all agreed life is hard. We all agreed on that. In a world of sin and suffering where life is hard, because of the faithfulness of God, we have a loud and triumphant song to sing. So even in the middle of struggle, we can know for certain that God has not and will not forget us. Even when we may feel like he's distant, God is with us. And you want to know the greatest part? The greatest part is that he will keep every single one of the promises he has made to us. He will not forget a promise or fail to come through on a promise. He will keep every one. We read these in Scripture. There are promises for him to strengthen us in the middle of our times of weakness, to give us wisdom in the middle of confusion, to give us peace in the middle of turmoil, rest in the middle of stress, calm in the middle of anxiety, courage in the face of fear, and hope in the face of of despair. And if that isn't enough reason to elicit unhindered worship from us, I don't know what is. The amazing thing is that the psalmist doesn't stop in asking all the peoples of the world to, to worship. It brings us to the final section of the psalm. Look at verses 7 through 9 with me again. He says this, let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. All of creation is summoned to sing praise to God, not just the peoples of the earth, but the, all of creation itself. And the reason that all of creation is to sing in praise of God is because he will come to rule and reign in righteousness. The righteousness of God will reign over the world and everything in the world will be made right one day. And all of creation can celebrate with us at the prospect that all will be made right. I mean, Paul talked about this uh, in the middle of uh, Romans chapter 8. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it to you and it's not on the screen. But this is uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. And the difficult that, difficulty that we experience in this life and feel at times in our lives is felt by all of creation. Listen to what Paul says. This is Romans 8, starting in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the, revel, uh, for the revealing of the Son's of God. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Paul is saying here that not only us, I mean, we have this longing and this feeling of, God, there's got to be something more. All of creation feels that too, is what Paul is saying here. The whole world, all of creation feels this longing of, God, please come make it right. Please come make it right. And he will. And when we, as human beings, submit to God's righteous rule and acknowledge his kingship over all things, then the rest of creation can flourish as well. I want to ask you a quick question. What is today's date? It's not a trick question. What's today's date? July 16th. That's right. Okay? Now, here's what we're going to do. If the Hallmark Channel can do it, so can we. All right? We're going to have Christmas in July right now. Did you know that Psalm 98 was what inspired Isaac Watts to write one of the most famous Christmas songs in all history? Um, David Platt writes... This psalm is why Isaac Watts wrote his hymn, Joy to the World. He wasn't painting a picture of the birth of Christ. He was painting a picture of the return of Christ. He wrote about the day when heaven and nature are fully united in song before Christ the King. So I want to read the lyrics of Joy to the World to us and see if you don't hear the echoes of Psalm 98 in here. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. Heaven and nature sing, and heaven, heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains, repeat the sounding joy. You hearing it? Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found. Far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Do you hear it? All the people of the earth, all of creation are called in to worship because God has made his righteousness and salvation known in front of all of creation. Watts wrote this hymn in anticipation of a day when Christ will come and rule the world with truth and grace, and we will perfectly enjoy the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. And while these things are made possible by the first coming of Jesus, for sure, we still wait for a day when all things will be made right and new. When we don't have to face difficulties or wonder if God is there, he will be with us and will reign over us. So here's how we respond today. We understand this. The king himself, Jesus Christ, has come in the flesh and at the cost of incredible pain to himself, he has paid the debt that we owed. He's broken the bonds of our captivity. He's cleansed us from sin. He clothed us in his righteousness. And he promised one day to bring us to a place that he's prepared for us where we will live with him forever. We only need to believe, to wait, and to hope. Like this psalm reminds us to do. Psalm 98 reminds us that in the meantime, as we have seen God's salvation shown to us, as we have seen him fulfill promise after promise, we trust in his faithfulness and we worship in the meantime with all of creation. Now, I agree with you. Life is hard. And there will be days when it's going to feel like God is far from us. 
But remember the words of Paul in Romans 8, 18. We just read them, but he says this. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Even the most difficult thing that we face, the most trying time that we experience, is not worth comparing to what we have laying ahead of us as followers of Christ. We can trust that God is faithful to us. And how can we do that? Well, we look at what he's done for his people throughout history. God has never failed his people. God has never forgotten his steadfast covenant love for his people, and he never will. God is with you in the dark moments. He's faithful to do what he's promised he will do. So today, I want us to take the opportunity to commit to trust God's word. Even when it looks like what we're experiencing in front of us is contrary to what God's word says, your senses are failing you at that point. God is with you. Let's trust that he's with us. He has not forgotten you. So this morning, uh, the chairman of our deacons, Johnny Hole, is going to be making his way down here. And this altar here is open. You can come today and you can commit to trust in the Lord and in his faithfulness. <clears throat> Maybe you do that for the first time today. Maybe you've not had a relationship with Jesus up until this point. That can change right now. That can change today. Maybe you have had a relationship with the Lord, but you found yourself in a place where you're struggling to trust that he is who he says he is, or that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. You can come this morning and say, God, give me faith. Give me faith to be strong. There's a song by a guy named Andrew Peterson. It's called Faith to be Strong. The chorus of that song, it says this. Give us faith to be strong. Give us strength to be faithful. Because life is not long, but it's hard. Give us faith to go on. Make us willing and able. Lord, give us faith to be strong. That's a prayer that you can pray today. And we can trust that God will answer that prayer and be faithful to us. Let's stand together, and as you do, let us pray as we respond to the word of the Lord this morning. God, you are faithful. You are true. We trust that you are who you say you are. We believe that you do what you say you'll do. And we know that we can trust in you today. So, Father, as we come before you to worship, remind us that your word is true. Remind us that we can trust in you and speak to our hearts today. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.